My grandfather, Kama, the president of parliament of Lebanon, president of the parliament is Nabih Birri. How do you kind of grasp the idea of my grandfather is the most powerful man in Lebanon? Uh, this is one of the regrets I have in life. What does from the prison of minds mean? It's when you start to view yourself, Arab Muslim, through the eyes of the oppressor. It happens very unconsciously. I was uncomfortable with my last name, Fadlullah, because it was hard for white people to pronounce. You start to justify it by saying, erase Ali and become Alex. My real estate business is going to do better. Ali went to Harvard. Ali gave a TED talk. Ali is doing very well in his life. You still describe that as part of the prison. That does not look like a prison to most people. I can't watch my TED talk anymore. I'm changing my voice because I'm in North Dakota, pink jeans for a flair of fashion. My ultimate message in that was if you're going to make music, make music that's positive, that's impactful. Today my message would be don't, no, don't make music. Do you think that going to Harvard puts you deeper into that prison? Many Western ideals are incompatible with Islam, period, point blank. A lot of people don't like to hear that. Walk me through the day of your father passing away. My sister Dima gives me a call. I'm sleeping in Los Angeles. Ali, something happened and Baba fell and he died. Call the lift to take me straight to the airport. I warned the lift driver that there's a really good chance I'm gonna lose my mind in this car. What was the hardest part of your dad leaving? Maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this. Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day and giving this podcast to listen. And I also wanted to remind you that the only way this podcast will ever grow is with your support and with your help. So subscribe to the podcast, like this video, and now let's get the show started. Welcome aboard Middle East Airlines. Ali, how are you? Um, Ali, I like to start this off with uh, self-reflection, you know? Uh, we're going to be talking about your book. We're going to be talking about a bunch of different things, but you've done so many things. You've gave a TED talk, you went to Harvard, you've written a book now, you've made music. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see uh, Abdullah. That's it. That's it. I remember uh, 10 years ago, I was in Lebanon, around 10 years ago, and uh, I went to visit my Khalo Abdullah mm -hmm. as soon as I arrived. And uh, we sat down, and the first question he asked me was, uh, Ali, do you know why you're here? I had a feeling this was going somewhere philosophical and not literal. And I said, I'm, I assume you don't mean Lebanon. He said, no, I mean on earth. And I said, yeah, I think I do. And he said, why? And I said, to serve, you know, to m impact humanity, to make a positive difference. And he said, that's not why you're here. And, you know, I felt a little insecure because I... I knew there was a right answer, but I didn't yeah. quite have a grasp on it, you know. But of course, that answer is in the Quran, and uh, he said you're here to serve Allah, to worship Allah. That's it. Mm. That's the only reason you're here, and it resonated deeply. Obviously, it's the truth. So when I really look in the mirror and I I boil it all down, that's what I should be seeing always. If I see anything else, it's it's a distraction. Yeah. And you're 36 six right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of got that question answer on a very, it's a turning point, 26, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned Lebanon. Um, how did your family end up here in America? Baba, Allah yirhamu, uh, immigrated when he was 16. Okay. He was the eldest of seven siblings of seven children and he came alone and he started uh, he borrowed some money from his uncle he bought his first car he fixed it he sold it he paid his uncle back he bought his next car and he repeated that process until he saved up enough money to bring his parents and his six siblings mm. uh, to to the united states he brought them all here all here one by one and um Mama was uh, born in Lebanon, then came here as an infant, and then went back for a while, and then returned. They met in college, married, and that's how they started their life here in mm. Dearborn. Something very interesting that you kind of wrote very subtle in the book is, my grandfather, Kama, 
the president of parliament of Lebanon. No, you did not mention the name. Yeah. Though, but for anyone that knows anything about Lebanon, the president of the parliament is Nabih mm-hmm. Birre, and that's your grandfather. Mm-hmm. How does that kind of affect, or not affect, but how how does that play a role in your upbringing, just in general, knowing that I'm pretty sure if your father came here at 16, um, he was in Lebanon. You guys visited Lebanon often. Yeah. Uh, your your mother is the president of the parliament's daughter, so I'm pretty sure you guys really vis- visited Lebanon often. Mm-hmm. How does how do you kind of grasp the idea of, oh, my my grandfather is the most powerful man in Lebanon? Mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, we were raised in my family, my immediate family, to never find our attach our sense of identity to my jiddo's identity as a politician, and. Um, you know, to never leverage that in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, that was not only emphasized through words, it was, it was demonstrated through the actions of my mother and father. Mm. So um, I think there was a period as I matured and started to more so realize who my Jiddah was within the socio-political context of Dearborn and Lebanon, where I maybe went a little bit more, uh, far to the extreme of disassociating too much and forgetting that this is my jiddo. He's only ever shown me kindness and love. Um, not for any reason other than I wanted to make sure that I was upholding that you know, value that I was taught by my parents. Um, but over time, you know, through, through visits and, and maturing and things of that nature, um, you know, I just grew to appreciate him as my, as my jiddo. And, um, you know, I, I really don't or you know organize my identity around any other aspect of it than mm-hmm. than him being my jiddo. It it's very difficult to do that though, uh, because y- you said you went to to the extreme of disso- dissociating, but I I feel like a lot of people would lean really into that and mm-hmm. make that their whole identity. Yeah, like that's all. That's who I am. You know, yeah. we are this very strong, powerful family in Lebanon, and. I tell you what to do. For example, you know, it, it comes off of a lot of ego, a lot of, uh, a lot of like, stop talking to me, right. you know? Right. Um, but you kind of went the very opposite route. Yeah. And I, I don't mean disassociating from him as a person, but just ensuring that, you know, that I wasn't ever playing to that. But to answer your question, well, that's where Terbeya comes in. Mm-hmm. And I think that if my father, or if my mother was like that, I'm sure I would have passed through that phase in my life where you know I want to lean into the power, into the fame that it might extend me, into the influence or whatever it may be, the privilege. But because Mama and Baba were unapologetically never that way, it really made it easy because the people that I looked up to the most as my role models that never demonstrated that. Mm. Uh, they always had the utmost humility. They always, um, you know, Asla, not that there's anything to not be hum- humble about you yeah. know just because your father is the president of parliament doesn't make you better than anybody so, yeah of course um my mom knew that and she embodied that truth and because she embodied it and my father was never that type of person mm-hmm. um you know his whole career is built on the fact that he he would not um i don't want to use uh, an appropriate language kiss up to anybody for lack of, of better mm-hmm. terms um you know, it just made it really easy. The path was shown to me the right way, alhamdulillah, in that regard. Mm. That's, that's, that's very nice to hear because I feel like a person on the outside looking at Ali or looking at Ali's family would be like, khalas, man, like, like these guys probably think they're better than everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, these guys probably are shayfin halan mm-hmm. too much, mm-hmm. you know. Um, for having and I'll give a lot of props to you to, to the parents then in that situation because uh, as we grow up we understand how powerful like influence is and how a lot of people get stuck in that and mm-hmm. and they want like people crave it like they're drooling for that uh, like that power so being parents raising kids and be like you know what we're not going to mix all of this together mm-hmm. you know let them uh be raised as their own individuals i think gives uh, give all the credit to your parents for, for that. yeah and you know the other thing jafar is that 
as hard as it is for people to believe, we, we never try to share this or prove this to anybody. Mm -hmm. But the reality is my parents were poor mm -hmm. and they grew up and they that, you know, from poverty to prosperity journey that many of in our community have been blessed to have. They went through that journey. It was as real for them as it was for anybody else. Mm. And that's not to dismiss the fact that, you know, when we land in Lebanon, there's certain privileges that we have that we get to skip a line and we get to do this and that. Um, but the, the impression people have or the romanticized image that there's just this bank account that, that is feeding into, yeah. into my family and everybody pulls from is, is far from reality, not only for my Jiddu, but for a lot of uh, families that have ties to a politician like that. Mm. And the last question on that is, how is, like, how are the meetings with your Jiddu now? Like, what kind of conversations do you, do you have with him? Um, especially now that you're 36 year old old, you're an adult. It's not like, like the term Jiddu is like, yeah, I'm a little small baby and he comes and kisses me on the head and maybe takes me to the shop. But now that you're, you're, you're an adult, what kind of conversations, like, do you focus more on the political side, just pick his brain? Or do you talk just about your personal life? Like what kind of conversations do you kind of try to have with him? Yeah. Uh, this is one of the regrets I have in life. Uh, not only with uh, my maternal jiddo, but my paternal jiddo, is and my uh, maternal sitto, uh, paternal sitto, because my maternal sitto speaks uh, English well. But my, I wish my Arabic was stronger. Mm. Um, it, that limits the nature of the conversations we can have. It's true that my jiddo does speak a little bit of English and you know can understand really well. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that the relationship could have been much deeper and can can be much deeper if I had the ability to communicate with him um, on that level. Mm. So um, it's been a little bit limited. Just, uh, you know, it, he'll ask me questions about what I'm doing or what I'm up to. Um, my favorite visit ever, uh, I've had a couple like this, um, particularly when my, I visit with my Khatu Farah, we usually visit him in his bedroom. So uh -huh. he'll be in his pajama, he'll be having breakfast, you know, his uh, daily spoon of asal, you mm. know, his, his traditions, his routines. Uh, but he's much more like relaxed, maybe by virtue of what he's wearing or just the environment yeah. that he's in. Um, whereas typically I visit him in the salon um, and we either sit down and have a chat or he likes to walk pace back and forth. Mm. And uh, that's his thing, you know, people will walk by him, uh, alongside him and pace back and forth in the room. Um, and, you know, we'll chat about kind of small talk, you know, school, yeah. life, where I'm at, what I'm up to, what's going on, things like that. Uh, the one time I think I did uh, press him on politics, so to speak, is I organized a trip for my classmates at Harvard. I think there was a group of eight of us uh, that flew to Lebanon. Uh, they st we stayed there for at least a week. I think it was like eight or nine nights. Uh, Baba was our tour guide all over the country, um, took us to all the sites. We visited several schools, public and private, and we visited Jiddo, and mm -hmm. we visited you know other um, leaders in the education sector, things of that nature. And uh, Baba prepped the group beforehand and he told them, don't hold back, you know, fire questions at mm. him. And Baba was the translator. <laughs> and uh, so they, they, they really, you know, they went in about the education sector and the state of Lebanon. And, um, you know, Jiddo, Jiddo handled it with poise, but uh, they definitely fired questions. And it wasn't like he minded or anything. He just took, took it. He didn't. I, I don't think he minded. I think at some point, you know, it, the, the questions started to pile on, mm. and um, you know, he seemed a tiny bit annoyed. Yeah. But, he went, but <laughs> it went well. Yeah, it That's went good. well. Alhamdulillah. What's your relationship like with Lebanon? What when you think of Lebanon, what do you feel, if anything? Yeah, um, I absolutely love Lebanon. Uh, I love the Janoub. Um My relationship wanes in terms of, you know, based on where I am in my life, uh, there's times where I want to spend a lot of time in the Shnub and kind of that peaceful, spiritual, meditative state um, near Baba's grave, you know, in Laila where we built a home. We're originally Bet Fadlallah min Aineta, but we migrated as a family to Laila. Um So I feel that deep connection to the South always, but depending on where I'm at in my life will dictate whether I want to spend a lot of time there or not. I, of course, I always want to visit my father in his grave. Of and course. The hadith, uh, you know, are clear about the power in, uh, of, of that spiritual presence at the grave sites. Um, and I, I, of course, believe in that wholeheartedly. 
Um, but then there's other times where I just want to be a, a Beirut boy, for yeah, lack of better of terms. You know, I have access to the the privileges that make it feel a little bit more like mm -hmm. I'm I'm in the United States, but obviously with yeah. a Lebanese vibe. Of course. One in three adults report not getting enough rest or sleep every single day. One of the reasons why that happens is they simply don't know. You think you're getting seven hours of sleep when you're probably getting between five and six. And how much of your sleep actually helped you recover? I struggled with my sleep for a very long time until I started wearing Whoop. With detailed analytics of how much sleep did I have, how many hours did I spend in my deep sleep or light sleep, to how well my body is recovered, take control of your sleep and try Whoop out for yourself. Go to join.whoop.com slash not from here and try it out for a month for free. And now, back to the episode. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is you said uh, visiting your father and stuff. It's, um, I think it's a struggle because uh, each and every one of us wants to be very close to our parents' graves um, and have that like easy access, yeah. so to speak. So it's, it's difficult, I feel like. like I want to sit by, and you, you've experienced it, um, you just want to sit next to his grave, complete silence, and just talk. Yeah, and you would want to do that. I would imagine more often than what you have access to right, right. now. Right, um, you writing a book alongside your father was uh, like it's an idea that was very like weird to me. You know, first I didn't know what if it was. Your father decided to write a book and then he passed and then you were like, no, let me continue it, continue that legacy that he started. Or, or, and then from what I understood, it was kind of, no, it was a kind of like an agreement. Like, no, let's write a book together. Uh, no, it was the former. It was the, the I was basically his editor. Oh, so, okay. That's what it was. So it was going to be his book mm. and I was going to have no part in it in terms of my story being told. Mm. At least that was where we left off when he passed away. Because I thought when he, he, he pitched the, the name, uh, I thought, and he passed it by you. I'm like, oh, so, I, so it was kind of an agreement that they would both co-author the book. But no, he was, it was just like an actual like pitch. To yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he, he deferred to me on a lot of things in okay. terms of, you know, he would, when he would pitch a title to me, if I told him I don't think it's a good idea, he would trust me. Mm. He trusted me as a writer, as an editor. And, um, you know, so when he pitched the idea to me, it just, of prison of minds, spiritually, it just really it hit me at yeah. my core. I knew it was the right title without even having the words to articulate why, yeah, as, as I discuss in the epilogue. You, you go and grab the book. First of all, how long after your father's passing do you think, okay, let me continue this book? Or is it like instantly like? Okay, no, I need to do this. He never released the book. I want to do it. Yeah. I'm not sure how soon after the thought occurred. Obviously, there were much more difficult traumas and priorities that I was mm -hmm. trying to process and, and move through. But as soon as the thought came, I, it was never a question as to whether I was going to finish the book or not. It was a huge question as to how I was going to do that. Um, now, I, at no point did I think, oh, this is impossible. I just knew that there was some sort of creative solution that I hadn't thought of yet um, because I knew, I knew I had to finish the book and I knew that I wasn't going to just take what he had produced thus far mm. and put it together and publish it because it wouldn't have been enough, enough or complete or really good, yeah. frankly, because uh, he never got it to finish it. Yeah. Um, so I think I always had a hunch that I was going to have to tell my story somehow, but it did kind of come as like one big epiphany. Like this is the only way, this is the best path forward. Mm. Talk to me about this moment, okay? You sit down on your computer or laptop, you open up the the file for, for the book, and then you read your father's words. Mm -hmm. How does that feel like after you know that this was his hard work and... Now you're just take it, going through his words, what he said. Yeah, in a sense, it's uh, on one hand, it's cathartic, it's beautiful. It's um, an opportunity to appreciate and reflect on his life and legacy. On the other hand, it's frustrating, uh, anger-producing, not towards him, of course, but towards the injustice he endured. And now 
the inability for him to complete that story. Mm. So you're juggling these, you know, this tug of war of feelings. Mm. So just for people who don't know, your father was a principal at a middle school here in Dearborn. And then he was appointed principal of one of the biggest high schools here. Yes. Fortson. The biggest. The biggest yeah. high school here. Um, do you think that because here's my dilemma why would they take someone that's very successful mm -hmm. and put them in a high school that was failing miserably yeah you can say because oh they saw that he was very being started being very powerful in the position that he was and then they put him in a failing high school where he can make it better mm -hmm. or you can or you can look at it the other way which is the more pessimistic way of looking at it but it is a way to look at it is they took him from this middle school and they wanted to take him down and they didn't want him to be this powerful because of the state of that high school like i i would did not live here i did not experience any mm -hmm. of this stuff but it gave me a feeling that the the way that the Hara, the the arabic um Amer the arab american was being dealt with like uh, with the person mm -hmm. um was very bad you know like the community was going downhill like yeah very downhill and when you want to hit the community you hit the educational system right and then you see this powerful arabic guy uh trying to do something and then yeah why not take him down too right 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 i, I mean from a perspective of not wanting this community to thrive it makes total sense to put them in a in a failing situation mm -hmm. for this guy what do you think about that so unfortunately your cynical view could have a lot of merit and i'm sure there are many many situations where the that version of the story that you just articulated is true alhamdulillah in this context it was for sure not true okay because the new superintendent that had taken over at the time dr john artis really cared about kids mm. he was a man who had a big heart for kids a big heart for education and he was a friend of my father's mm. he got to the district he was new and right away you know as a good superintendent would he was able to evaluate the talent in the district from the perspective of the administrators the okay. principals and you know start to see all right what what am i working with here from a team perspective mm. and where are the biggest needs the biggest gaps and who can fill those gaps and so he came to Baba several times and he asked him, you know, Ahmad, we really need you at Fortson. John, I'm very happy with the work-life balance I have. You know, I have young children. Um, we have a well-oiled machine here at Stout Middle School. We've worked very hard to get to this point. You know, we're one of the highest performing middle schools in the state right now. I love my staff. Everything is moving beautifully. Let's not mess with it. Let, there's are many capable administrators who really want that position. There's people begging you guys each year to go there. Choose one of them. Several of them are qualified. Mm. I don't want it. So he came once. You know, he said, fine. He came a second time. Baba told him, you know what? Here's a list of names. You're new. I know you're new. Here's a list of names that people he that want it. Names. He gave him a list of names. All right, Imad, I'll look into it. But I think, you know, he knew deep down, Dr. Artis, that Baba was the man for the job. Mm. So the last time he came, it was, you know, by force. Yeah. I'm your boss, and this is what, this is what I'm doing. You okay. have two days to... Okay. To adjust, <laughs> that makes uh, that makes sense. Um, the the stuff that catches my eye when I was reading what your dad went through is the first day he was on the job, immediate disrespect from one of the students. Yeah, immediately. Yeah, you know, and I would imagine that that happened multiple times. It wasn't just like a one and done thing. How does as a grown man, you know? Um, how does that affect him, if at all, when he goes back home? Mm -hmm. Like, did you feel like at one point he was like, yeah, this might not work. Like, this project is, like, I can't keep getting, be I can't keep getting disrespected like this from mm -hmm. students and from people, you know? How, how did, does that translate to your, inside the walls of your home? It's an excellent question. And for him, it wouldn't be from the perspective of, the ego of how dare this young child disrespect me or talk to me in this manner. I, you know, I don't want to be here in this building mm -hmm. more, more so from the perspective of it hurt him deeply it to see that, yep. you know, our young 
Muslimin, our young children in this district, regardless of, of race or religion, are speaking to adults in this manner. So it hurt him. And he knew that a tremendous culture change needed to take place. And this, again, goes to that theory of, you know, were they placing him in this position to take him down or to empower him? And how the superintendent responded to these needs, to Baba's need to say, hey, I need to clean house. I need to clean the culture. I need to raise expectations was going to say everything about their true intention. Mm -hmm. And so when Baba sat down with Dr. Artis and had that heart to heart and said, John, I made you a promise I can't keep. I can't remain here without rocking the boat. John said, you know, rock it, rock it. And had he not given Baba that green light, you know, he wouldn't have had the impact he had. And I think he would have come home feeling defeated. But because he had the support he needed behind him, albeit small and from a couple people, but mm. key strategic people, the superintendent, a couple key board members, because he had just enough support, subhanAllah, because Allah, Allah is the best of planners, yeah. he was able to make the, the large-scale change that he and made. And rocking the boat meant firing a lot of people. It meant, yeah, it meant A lot of partly, people had to go. Partly. Yeah. When you have criminals in your building, mm. When you have and, you know, bigots, you yeah. have to you have to sometimes take. Did that come and bite you back as his ch as his son? I would say it bit my sister Rima way worse than it bit me. She How was so? a freshman. Okay. I was a senior with a few months left. Yes, you're. I was spending most done. of my day in college. Uh, you know, dual enro duly enrolled. So, the it did it bit me for sure. It bit me even before he got there, which mm. is, I think, unless you read the book, is a little bit hard to believe. But once you see the greater community context of the influence he had, the fact that there was another Fadlallah, his, co his first cousin in the building, and the culture and history of bigotry in our community, and you know, the community not wanting to see you know, Arabs or, or specific families who are Arab rise into positions of power and influence, they were a huge threat to this status quo, and they reacted accordingly. How did it bite your sister Rima? She was constantly harassed. Um, there was a teacher who would do monologues for 15 minutes instead of the 15 minutes of silent reading time that was recommended. Uh, he would do a monologue about, he, first he would show 15 minute clips of Fox News, which was constantly spewing anti uh, uh, Arab and, and Islamophobic uh, mm -hmm. rhetoric, propaganda. Um, and then um, he would make uh, comments about this administration's this and this administration's that. Um, one time she was wearing a word shirt and he, he grabbed her by the arm and he started, you know, he stared down at her shirt to read it. And obviously he's, you know, staring at a woman in a very uncomfortable, you know, uh, place. Of course. Um, and so there were constant acts of disrespect and, uh, and of that nature. Uh, one of her track coaches asked her, you know, why does your father never come to your track meets? Uh, why does he visit Lebanon so often? What does he do there? What's he like when he gets angry? Um, does he talk to you? What about? You know, th these were the, the constant things that she was enduring. And she never wanted to tell Baba because she saw the amount of stress that he was under and she didn't want to add to that pressure. How did you think he would have reacted to that? Because that situation is tricky. You can't just let your emotions go and uh, and just lose your mind on these, uh, uh, like on these, on the coach or on the teacher or stuff like that because that'll put you in a very bad spot. Right. And uh, it'll decredit your position in a way. Right. So, how did you think he would have dealt with that? I think he would have dealt with it very tactfully in such a way where, had any other student come and said, These are the questions my track coach is asking me about my parents, my father would have seen that as a, a violation of a sort of code. Mm. written or unwritten it's probably written i'm not exactly sure where that line is drawn um but he would have confronted that coach and said hey you're making this child feel uncomfortable for a b and c reason maybe he would have taken a a, a less direct approach but nevertheless made it clear to that a teacher or a coach or whoever it was that i'm aware of what you're doing and you know skate on thin ice because this yeah. is my child and i have a right as a parent the same way any other parent does do you pick up on these uh, on these traits for your dad? You said you're a senior. Um, so just about the time where you start kind of trying to understand how the world works and, you know, um, do you understand how important what your dad was doing at the time? Or did you look at your dad as just, he's just my dad, do, you know, Baba Bilbet tells me to do this and that, or kind of, oh, Baba is going against this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and I have to see what he does here. I mean, it would be 
crazy of me to think that I understood the importance or the scale of what he was doing. Mm. I think uh, to put it in perspective, he has these uh, famous assemblies that he did when he first took over as principal that were later called the the new sheriff in town assemblies. That's what students and teachers called them. Mm-hmm. Because he came on stage, he was introduced, the new, you know, we have the new principal here of our high school. As he walked onto the stage, kids started to clap and cheer, you know, in a, in a crazy fashion. He started yelling, don't clap, don't clap, don't clap. You know, and he introduced himself. And he, I remember him saying uh, during one of these assemblies that I was sitting in as a student, uh, he said, I smell Vicodin in the air. Okay. And I remember thinking, Baba, you can't smell Vicodin. You know, yeah. you could have said that about weed, but you can't say that about Vicodin. It doesn't have a scent. Yeah. And I, I remember feeling embarrassed about that because I didn't want him to look silly, you know. Yeah. The slick where my mind was at. Did you not want him to look silly or did you not want the the your classmates to be like, oh, that's the principal's dad and the principal doesn't know anything? Yeah, so that too, yeah. that element, you know, the wanting to look cool in front yeah. of my, my friends and, uh, you know, Look where my priorities were yeah. versus recognizing or being humbled by the size of the issue in our building. Like, oh, wow, Baba's discovering drugs and, you know, all of these things in my in mm. my friend's car. And I don't know the impact of Vi- that Vicodin has and the fact that a lot of my friends who are dependent on this drug and taking it daily, you know, what that does. I just, for them, it's cool. And I know I can't do it. I know it's bad, but I don't understand, you know. The severity of it. Exactly. What does from the prison of minds mean? It really, it finds its roots initially from this heart-to-heart conversation that Baba and Dr. Artis had where, you know, Baba was telling him, I ha- I can't continue in this position without rocking the boat. Please appoint a permanent principal as soon as possible. Dr. Artis says, you know, uh, what's going on? Why? And he says, um, John, this year, this building is at least 10 years behind. And, you know, um, the kids are third class citizens in this building. Um, everything is designed to cater to staffers and not students. And Dr. Artis says, this is a lot of discovery for three days time, Imad. Be specific mm. with me. And Baba starts to detail all the things that are the, the chaos that's taking place, the prison like climate at Fortson High. The fact that one student was admitted to U of M Ann Arbor in 2004. By the time, within five years, over 120 students were admitted into U of M Ann Arbor of of Baba being principal, and several more were admitted into Ivy League schools. The expectations were extremely low of students. He asked counselors how many letters of rec they wrote. They all proudly answered zero, because if our kids do go to college, which many of them won't, they'll end up down the street at Henry Ford, which doesn't require an ACT or an SAT or a letter of rec or any of that. So we don't do any of that stuff for them. Um, Not that there's anything wrong with Henry Ford College. I teach at Henry Ford College. I love Henry Ford College. But we shouldn't be limiting students uh, to... You can only go there. You can only go there. Um, So, you know, Baba started to highlight to him the policies, procedures that, you know, having to wear an ID, the only school in the district where you had to show your numbers at all times, just like you're in a prison. Whereas your numbers, you don't have your numbers suspended for 10 days. 10 days? 10 days. Oftentimes, 10 days for coming late. Uh, They would lock the doors on students, which at the time was against the law. Um, When other students were in the classroom, if they were tardy, oftentimes students were tardy for legitimate reasons. Coming back from a field trip, teacher kept them after class for a conversation, etc. Didn't matter whether you had a pass or not. You were locked out, had to go to the office. Oftentimes, you were suspended for that. So... Once he shared all of this with Dr. Artis, he finished by saying, John, this is a prison of young minds. That was that. And one day, months into, maybe years into me and Baba working on the book, uh, he was passing back and forth. And he said, "Uh, Jake, I have the title. And, you know, I looked up at him nervously. I'm like, man, this better be good, you know, because I don't want to tell him. I don't want to hurt his feelings. He seems so excited. Yeah. You know, I don't want to hurt his feelings and say, Baba, that's not that's not a good title. Um. But subhanAllah, man, when he said the prison of minds, I, 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 every hair in my body stood up. Every hair in my body. I just, it, it was an unbelievable feeling. And, um, you know, it, it continued to, the significance of the title continued to grow in my mind because then it became, you know, thinking about, well, what was the impact of me uh, of, of being in the prison of minds as a student when I had to finish the book myself 
then it was like, you know, that's when I came up with the prison of my mind because I saw that much of what I endured and struggled with after high school in terms of a, from a mental health perspective was rooted in this experience I had, you mm-hmm. know, K through 12 in Dearborn Public Schools, especially in high school. The, the interesting part of prison of minds is what you detailed was it's a beautiful story of how your father found that these students were locked in a prison of minds. But you take that concept and you apply it to every single one of us, to yourself, to myself, to anyone you see outside in the streets. We are all locked in some sort of prison, you know? Yes. Um, what, what's the prison of your mind? It's a great question. I mean, I think... Um, it's Especially that part of your life. I'm right. Not, you know? Right. Like, uh, up until your father's passing what was the prison that you were going through describe to me how that dungeon looked like yeah um it was a dungeon where i had a lot of internalized oppression and to define that term it's uh, it's a sociological term it comes from the field of sociology Mm -hmm. and it's when you start to view yourself or others who are part of your group arab muslim through the eyes of the oppressor and it, it happens very unconsciously where you want to start to disassociate from your identity, from being Muslim, from being Arab, not in such a direct way where you would want to say, you know, I don't want to be Arab or I'm not Arab or I'm not a Muslim anymore. For some people, it does get to that. Mm-hmm. But even for those of us that are, that are trying to latch on to those identity markers, um, if we're not truly educated and empowered in what our identity is, then we start to want to disassociate. And that can look so many ways. That can look... Um, you Are they know, wanting to be Alex? Yeah. For yeah. The, for uh, or you know you have a beautiful beautiful name, Jafar, mm. and for a long period of my life I disliked your name, and when I you know I studied uh, media a lot, uh, the impact of media and in its many forms whether it's um, music, um, you know literature, um, you know podcasts whatever it may be how does media impact us the way we see ourselves, and I think back to as silly as it may seem to some. These are when the seeds are planted. I think back to those Disney movies as a child, how there was, you know, Prince Ali, which made me feel better about my name and my identity. Mm. And there was Jafar, mm. the evil villain. Yeah. Right. And so look at the name, look at the name they chose. Right. And then you later on, as you mature in your identity and you start to learn about Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, it's impossible to meet Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, meet in the sense of learn about him, become educated about him regardless of what religion you belong to or what sect you belong to, mm-hmm. and not fall in love with him. Mm. And by extension of falling in love with him, you fall in love with the name. And that name starts to carry a, a beauty and significance that you can't unsee or undo. Subhanallah. Absolutely. So these are the ways that internalized oppression, you know, starts to rear its ugly head. And so you thought that it was getting to you to where you were starting to detach from that identity? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there was, I'd be dishonest to say that there wasn't an extended period of my life where, you know, I was uncomfortable with my last name, Fadlala, because it was hard for white people to pronounce. Or I felt like if I called a restaurant or I called a place and I said Fadlala, then I was less likely to get what I needed. Mm. So you start to justify it by saying, I can get further along in society. If I, you know, erase Ali and become Alex, my real estate business is going to do better. My ability to get this job promotion will be better. Um, it's a very tempting route to go down and it's easy it's easy and it's a slippery slope it's a very very slippery slope how does your day that's no judgment on of course you know, we all have loved ones and family members that have gone from Hassan to sam or whatever mm. it may be it's not a judgment you know it's i i'm i'm telling you i will i am foremost historically guilty of it and still i'm sure i'm doing some of those layers mm-hmm. it, it just happens and l- like you said it's okay i i love my name and everything but if I'm ordering a coffee in a predominantly white area and I don't feel like going back and forth because if I say Jafar, they're going to be like, what? How do you spell it? Mm-hmm. I I still to this day sometimes just say J. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Who's this for? J. Mm-hmm. I just want to get this over with. I'm trying to get my coffee and leave. Yeah. You know, so we are still guilty of it. Do we try our best to take to go that extra mile and say, no, Jafar, and it's J-A-A-F-A-R? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're trying, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? 
But how does your day to day look like while you're in prison? Yeah, just a quick note on that. Go ahead. I think it's just it more comes back to you. There's nothing wrong with giving the person J because you want to keep it moving. But if you feel if you feel that sense of any sort of shame or I'm going to be embarrassed of saying Jafar, mm. you know, or if they can't pronounce it, I'm going to feel less proud of my name. That's that's what you yeah, want to interrogate. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Very, very good point. Yeah. And even that, that could even we could even extend that. I'm sure there's maybe I have a cousin Hussein that I know for sure is, uh, loves Imam Hussein salam and loves his name. He goes by Sam. He has his reasons. As long as Baino ben Nafso, he's at peace. I'm not saying there's something objectively wrong with it. Mm -hmm. I'm saying oftentimes, more often than not, it's a red flag for us internally to know that there might be a sign of internalized depression mm -hmm. there. Day to day, yes, I started to, um, you know, the 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 slippery slope that we describe. It starts with these little things, um, but it evolves into us. You know, when we're not educated about our deen. When we're Muslims culturally and not through our own spiritual journey, um, then you're vulnerable. You're prone to making mistakes, uh, to distancing yourself from your deen, uh, to deprioritizing your salah, deprioritizing other aspects of your deen, and going down the wrong path in its various forms. You know, whether it's um, weed or alcohol or, you know, uh, being in inappropriate relationships or whatever it may be, um, these are things that. Let's be let's be real. A, yeah. a large, large percentage of our community struggles with, and um, you know, it's 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 also a result of internalized depression. You know, I ask you about that because, for me, looking on the outside, Ali went to Harvard. Ali gave a TED talk. Ali is doing very well in his life. He's accomplishing these milestones that a lot of people really want to, and you still describe that as part of the prison that does not look like a prison to most people mm -hmm. that looks like oh this guy's doing the right things you know getting a phone call from ted getting accepted to harvard yeah. all these things are not your typical prison like uh events that occur in your life yeah but you still describe that part of your life as part of that prison yeah yeah i think that's uh one of the ironies in the book in chapter 12 it's called still broken mm. i really try to highlight this contradiction on the one hand harvard was a dream come true and up until this day you know when i make dua and i thank allah for all the blessings and the ones i take for granted and can't even think of and then i go down my list of things that i can think of you know and obviously you know family our health you know those things come first but down somewhere down on that list i, I still thank him for the fact that i got into harvard because it was huge for me it was yeah. humongous especially as somebody who was never a good test taker. Um, my GPA uh, coming out of college was a 3.5, I think maybe a 3.6. Um, there was nothing metric-wise or statistically that would think like, oh, this guy's for sure getting into Harvard. Bil'aq, this guy's for sure getting rejected from Harvard. Um, but alhamdulillah, I had enough work experience and other things to uh, compensate for my shortcomings uh, in terms of those metrics mm. that helped them see something in me and want to take a chance on me. And... Um, so I say all this to say, you know, those are blessings and they're not ones I take for granted ever. And I do think Harvard had a great positive impact on me. But during that journey, while I was earning my doctorate, I was also mentally ill in many ways. I was, that's when I uh, sought help for, to see a, a psychiatrist. I talk about that in length in the book. And, you know, there's this juxtaposition of there's this guy, he's at Harvard. He's even learning about adult development psychology. He's even teaching people about it. He's even responsible for helping people on that, on that journey themselves. And yet, in his private life, he's seeing a therapist weekly. He's working through serious traumas. He's trying to undo these layers of internalized depression. He feels broken. He's distant from his dean, you know, but, but trying to get closer. All of these things are happening, and, and they often coexist in the same person. Do you think that going to Harvard puts you deeper into that prison? That's an excellent question. Um, no, okay, I don't. Um, I think it helped me because I do think education is really, really powerful. I do think that traditional education, higher education, um, you know, whether somebody's earning their master's or doctorate somewhere, medical school, dental school, if you're not very careful 
and you're not staying in communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can corrupt your soul, it can corrupt your spirit. Uh, we are in the West. Many Western ideals are incompatible with Islam. Period, point blank. A lot of people don't like to hear that. Um, you know, And sure, a lot of uh, values or cultural traditions that have emerged in the East, in the Middle East, are incompatible with Islam. Of I'm course. not denying that. Yeah. But for sure, uh, there are a lot of Western ideals that are totally incompatible with our deen. And many of us are disconnected from our deens. We're spiritually disconnected. Mm. We might be cultural Muslims. We might even pray and fast. But that communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absent. It's largely absent. Some of that is our fault. Some of that is the fault of our society and the environment. And the environment. And that's why that I ask in. about Harvard because you're in this. You're in Harvard, one of the most prestigious schools in the world, and then there is a lot of pressure. It, the environment might not let you really. It might not let you want think that you have time to pray. For example, yeah, it may it may push you a little bit towards yeah smoking get your uh, mind off things you know like it could have that kind of effect yeah and that's why i asked you if being in that place and that environment uh not as much i didn't mean it much uh, on the educational end because of course like you said the more education the better but the environment how was that there yeah yeah um don't get me wrong i was still uh not doing I, I was still trying to reform myself while I was at Harvard. There were still a lot of mistakes I was making. There were still sins I was guilty of. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to correct those things. But overall, in the, in the large picture of things, I think the environment, the you know where I was staying, the campus that I was on, the intellectual environment around me, because I had the intention to come closer to Islam, mm -hmm. You know, we've all heard it, I think, or many of us have heard it. You know, when you take one step towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll take five or ten yeah. steps towards you. I was taking those steps while at Harvard. No matter where also you, you are, were, I was taking even those steps. Even when you were, were seeking a psychiatrist, yes, you, were, you made it clear that you wanted to get closer to God. 100%. Okay. And I, I love that you brought that up because I think a lot of people hear psychiatrist as a, a antidote or as like, and the opposite way the opposite of religion. way yeah yeah oh if you're if you're making dua you don't need a therapist yeah and if you're going to a therapist you're not talking about god exactly. and therapy exactly but if that's true then we should look at any hakim the exact same way mm. if i broke my arm we all agree that i should go see uh dr adam or orthopedic surgeon of course right but if i uh you know if i'm mentally ill if i have a serious diagnosable illness right which i did at the time then just make dua and everything goes away. No, you're, the answer to your dua might be a therapist. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with a therapist? Yeah. I mean, a therapist is they're des, they're trained. A lot of people think that you're going to them to solve you or fix you, and you should be going to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. No, the therapist is trained in how to ask you the right questions, how to help you discover more about yourself, to be a very good listener like you are. You're 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 a therapist. A lot of people when they talk about your podcast, they're like, man, this guy's. Like more like a therapist, and I think it's an excellent compliment. That means you're an excellent listener. You're you're following what you're hearing. You're not just going by a script, even if you have pre-planned questions, and you're empathizing deeply with the person on the other side. And you're trying not only to understand them better, but help them better understand themselves. Mm. You have all the tools of a therapist, right? They just have years of study and some more frameworks, and mm. those frameworks are very helpful sometimes to help you better understand yourself and heal yourself. You're not going to them to fix you. You're going to them to help for them to help you fix yourself. Right. Absolutely. Okay. And I think that is a good clarification because a lot of people don't like to have that association of you're going to a therapist. That means you're you're moving farther away from the religion. And that's just a very negative way to go about it. Absolutely. Um, but another thing that I wanted to ask you about is your TED talk and you said that you were infected with internalized oppression mm -hmm. while you do, like you said, you look back at the TED talk and that's what you see. Yeah. What about that makes you feel like you were a state in, of internalized oppression? When I look, when I, I can't watch my TED talk anymore. Um, and that's, that's probably a different form of internalized oppression uh, because I shouldn't be looking and shaming myself. That's not just another form. Um, 
But when I look at the TED Talk, and I'm even just trying to look at it objectively, you know, I see somebody who is trying to fit in. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm changing my voice because I'm in North Dakota and the audience is largely Caucasian. Um, I'm, you know, wearing, uh, I think I said in the book, you know, pink jeans for a flare of fashion. Um, you know, I was trying to kind of, uh, I wasn't being true to myself. And mm. I didn't even know my true self at the time to be true to myself. I think I really set the intention before I get on any stage, including then, that, you know, Ali, be true to yourself, you know, be you, you know, don't, don't try to appease, um, just be you, you know. Um, but when you're that distant from your, from your true self, it's, it's really hard. So when I look at it, I still see somebody who's trying to, to fit in and appease. How would, now looking back at it, how would you have wanted to go on that stage? And what would you have wanted to talk about, if anything, if you could pick the topic of your choice? You know, I, I will say, I think um, the topic I chose um, w could have been a really effective topic. Today, my message would definitely be different because my ultimate message in that was if you're going to make music, uh, make music that's, you know, positive, that's impactful, uh, use hit song science as a means to uh, inspire and change the world. Uh, today, my message would be don't don't make hits. Don't make <laughs> no, don't make music, yeah. you know. And I, I know that's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. Yeah. I really do. I, and if anybody empathizes with that as somebody who dedicated over a decade of my life um, you know, to learning how to mix, master music, produce music, uh, write music. Um, I went to several schools of music. Um, I get it. I how, get it. How do your parents react to that? Especially you talking about your dad. He he looks like like a very religious individual. You know, um, when you tell him, "Baba, I'm, I want to learn how to make music." Uh, music is a like, it's a sin, and we look at it as no, you shouldn't be doing that. So how does your father react to that? Yeah, I think Baba saw it for what it was. He saw it as um, my son is lost. He's trying to find himself. Mm. And I need to tawul bele and hold his hand on this journey. I think my father increasingly started to realize that despite his greatest attempts in the world, sharing the hadith, uh, you know, sharing Quran, embodying um, the, the, the spirit of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhi wa salam, um, he could only shield us so much from, you know, the environment Noise, that yeah. we were in. And, and I think if he was more aware of how impactful that environment was, whether it was our school, the media we were consuming, the friends we were hanging out with, the amount of freedom he, he, he gave us, um, all those socio-political, cultural influences that were, that were hitting on us. And that's why it's hard to be the child of immigrants, first generation, you know, mm -hmm. or an immigrant trying to parent. If he was aware of all of that, he would have taken much more proactive measures, but he he was a victim, you know, like we were. Yeah, he would have handled it way differently, yeah. for sure. And same as same for Mama. Mm. Were you happy back then? Were you? F did you feel like you were accomplishing something while you were going through that prison, or was it kind of you were just going with the flow? You know, it's um, this can be so confusing, and I I think even I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but. Um, I, I think that for the most part, although I had some, you know, dark days, um, I'm, I'm, I was a happy person. Um, mm -hmm. now that happiness does not come anywhere near to the peace or contentment I feel now, mm -hmm. which by the way, I don't think the goal in life is to be happy. A lot of people think it's to be happy. It's not, it's not, it's to be content, right? Cause you can be content through good and bad through tragedy. You can be content through, you know, the greatest of days, you can be content. And uh, our deen teaches us to stay balanced through the highs and the lows. Um, and so when you focus your goal on contentment versus happiness, uh, then you, you focus yourself on a goal that's attainable and of that course. Islam is going to help, help get you to. Whereas if you do, if you focus on happiness, which a lot of people do. Um, it's very temporary. It is very temporary. Like you'll be happy for sure. A exactly. week, a month maybe. Then that goes away, and then you're 100%. running, running back to it. And the lows are much lower. Yes, yes. Um, I think about your surroundings a lot during that period, um, while you being in the prison, because I feel like there are people that try that are trying to get you out of the prison, but at the same time, there's an opposite force that are people that are keeping you in the prison. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the people that were keeping you in the prison. Mm -hmm. 
were they doing the same things that you were doing? How were you looking, like were you looking at their advice as if these people know what they're talking about and the people that want me out of the prison, those people, how, what, how would they know what's best for me? Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the people that wanted to keep me in the prison, when I really think of it in a, a, a literal malicious way like that, I, I think I could think of like the teachers who were, you know, hateful or had bigotry. Or, but when I think of it more from a peer perspective, mm -hmm. it's not so much they wanted to keep me there as much as maybe they just wanted to keep me around as a friend. Yeah. And this was their way of seeing the world and their ideology and the way they practice their life. Mm -hmm. So um, when I think of, you know, those people, unfortunately, some of them were some of the closest people to me some of my nearest and dearest uh, loved ones, family, friends, um, who, you know, were headed down the wrong path mm -hmm. and, and wanted me as a companion uh, on that path. And then I think of other uh, loved ones and friends. I think of my cousin Hassan. And my cousin Hassan, uh, may Allah reward him tenfold, he, he took an unbelievable approach with me because as strict as he was about his religion, um, he was never judgmental even when you know we got on the phone and he would caution me about things and I did it anyway I never sensed that you know that ego come into play where yeah. it's like you know I'm better than you I'm better than you whatever you know what the door's always open when you're ready I'm here for you that was always the heart posture subhanallah you can just sense you can sense the heart posture yeah without even words his heart posture was always that one of non-judgment, one of love. Um, even when I did some things that, you know, triggered him or bothered him, you know, there was a t time period where I was getting closer to the deen. And alongside my daily music videos that I was posting on social media, we would cut them up, you know, I'd be doing raps or whatever. Then I'd release a Quran video, one minute Quran video, and I'd read a surah from the Quran and I'd interpret it. And they'd be very simple, like the beautiful one you're wearing right now, after mm -hmm. hardship comes ease. You know, most of us can explain that in pretty safe terms. You know, if you're going through a storm, whatever it may be, just know that there's there's ease coming on the other side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that in the Quran. You're most likely not erring yeah. with what I just said, yes. right? But he taught me that, you know, you can't interpret Quran. Ahl al-Bayt are the only ones that could interpret the Quran. Yeah. But they didn't interpret everything. Who says? Who says? Says who? Did you try? Did you, look, did you read their hadith for you to say they haven't interpreted everything? You know? And so it's like, all right, I don't know. This, he's saying something that's really piqued my interest. I've never really looked deeply into this hadith thing. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of controversy around it. You know, but let me just keep going for now because I really like the Quran videos are making me feel really good. You know? So I do that. Did you feel bad posting the music videos? No. For a while until, until somebody, I can tell you that story briefly as well. But... My point being, when I kept releasing those Quran videos, I didn't sense that, like, you know, like Haida. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, no, I sensed, you know, I'm here for you. Whenever you want to see the light, whenever you have questions, whenever you want to dig deeper, I'm here for you. So my cousin Hassan played a huge role. You know, Ali, I, 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 I kind of. I, I love that you mentioned that because it's people look at that. And if they see someone that's let's take the example that you gave, you were posting music videos and at the same time you were posting Quran. Um, people look at that for the most part and see uh, Ali is confused and he's painting a bad picture for the religion. I really hate that point of view. And I'd rather look at him posting Quran videos as uh, a lifeline, you know, like this person isn't as bad as you guys think he is mm -hmm. you know okay he's posting music videos and music videos aren't the best to post and whatever but he like there's a lifeline there like he's interested in quran or or he's posting that he's praying every day or whatever w whatever the case may be i don't think it's neg i think it's very positive yeah you know because that means that there there is a lifeline for this person that he can come out of that place that he's in right now yeah you know what i mean yeah. and i just hate that in society it's, it's it's not looked at like that it's looked at as this person is just painting a bad 
a bad picture for the religion. Allah mishrahit abal minushi. Uh, everything that he's doing al fadiya God's not going to accept the prayer like that's a, v- a very negative connotation to mm-hmm. someone that is trying and that's what we're all doing yeah yeah maybe you're a, you're a little ahead of me t- of trying but he's on he's on that path too yeah 100% i mean it's it's very beautiful what you're saying and it's just that shifting that perspective from one of of non judgment well, from one of judgment to non judgment and I think the response to you from, you know, people would be, Enta, you just don't want to name it for what it is. You know, you're trying to decorate this in a, in a pretty way. No, I'm acknowledging what he's doing is wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you the music's a sin. And yes, he's probably lost. Now, what do we do with that? Do we, you know, do we assume that he knows better and he's doing this to be vicious and try to pull people away from the deen? Right? Maybe, you know, I have to think that if you don't know who I am. But if you know who the person is and you care about them, then try to empathize a little bit. Even if you don't, it's your obligation. Mm-hmm. You're, not doing, you're not doing the person a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. You're obliged. If you uh, are ascribing to the deen, you're judging him for, for his shortcomings, you've just sinned. Mm-hmm. Now, now you're, you're disobeying your deen. You know, because the uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam, the imams, they're very clear about this in numerous hadith. You know, it suffices you to focus on your own sins. Mm-hmm. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, yes. um, you know, or, um, or, or never, never assume that somebody's done. Like they're just, you know, they're, they're toast yeah. in terms of deen. Because at the last second, they can flip. They can repent. At the last second. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the example of the magicians in the Quran. At the last second, you know, uh, they, they flipped and they were, they were forgiven. And then there's the opposite too, right? Yeah. There's um, people who, they, they also tell us, never assume somebody's good for sure. Yeah. This person for sure, Janna. Because they can flip at the last yeah. second. You'll never know too. You'll never know. Um, I kind of got that, um, that wake up call. Um, I, had a, a, I had a sales job at AT&T. And um, one of my coworkers used to make music. And uh, we had this like uh, small room upstairs where that's where we would go pray and uh, one time i was going up to pray while he was coming down and when i looked at the guy i just assumed that he makes music that he doesn't pray Mm. which on my part was was obviously bad but then he was walking down and i'm like what were you doing he was like i was praying i was like oh for real he was like yeah um i do not i haven't missed a prayer and i don't know how long and it kind of hit me i like like I had this preconceived notion of this person that he does not pray because he does music and all these things and he's, he's very out there. And I'm like, man, like that's so beautiful. Like he, he like even if that's the lifestyle that he chose, he still dedicates time to talk to God. And who am I to judge how this person talks to God? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And of course, like you said, we're not um, we're not trying to say that what he's doing is right. I believe that music is haram, mm. but I, it was bad for me to judge a person that maybe that's his lifeline to by then he is going to flip 180 degrees and go in the opposite direction. 100%. And that helped me with my jiddu, actually. I walked in one time and I saw him praying mm. and I asked, you know, is he you know, consistent with it? And I was told he never misses a prayer. Mm. And I witnessed it on numerous occasions on the clock, you know, and that helped me make that shift from, you know, Nabe Birre to Jiddu Nabe, you know, just let me let me just humanize my this is my Jiddu, you know, regardless of whatever. You thought that he wasn't consistent? I or thought you just maybe like he a wasn't. preconceived notion? Yeah, yeah, maybe he was. I don't know. I just didn't know. Mm. And it was just a like a kind of a humbling or beautiful reminder that I can just focus on my Jiddu and not think about all this. Yeah. All that's the noise around that's around the person. Yeah. Because at our core, even if someone does not seem religious and through this podcast i realized that i always say i never wanted this to be like a religious conversation but talking to people from from each and every background from what the very different experiences somehow by themselves everyone goes back to god everyone connects back to god in a certain way and pleads to god in a certain way so it's like Everyone's really doing their own thing. If you just remove the noise and the uh, mazahir yeah. from the person, like what they're actually showing or how this girl dresses, everyone 
calls to God for help. Mm -hmm. And that was like a very big realization. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, you know, our parents come here. You mentioned immigrant parents and they come here. And I and I know from my parents that their number one concern is they don't want us to get lost. Mm. You know, they want us to stay on our religion, stay with the culture. And w if they see us going in a separate way, that really like it hurts them deeply. When your dad saw you go on that, uh, go into the prison, um, how did he feel? How concerned was he? <sighs> Broken. Absolutely broken, heartbroken. And it showed up in his emails, which are in the book. Mm. And I shared some of the most, you know, the most, not some of, the most vulnerable writings between he and I. So the most vulnerable exchanges we've ever had mm. were through writing. And those are in the book. And nobody knew about those before this book was released. Not my, well, my mom read the book before it was released. But, you know, my siblings... My aunts, my uncles, nobody had ever read or even know, knew about any of these writings. And it showed how broken Baba was. You know, Ale, they were, they were, in your action it seemed between a friend and a friend with a hint of, I am your father, mm -hmm. okay? But they were very, very friendly. Is that the type of relationship that you guys have? My, yes. My father was my best friend. He truly mm -hmm. was think if you asked him he'd say Ibrahim Sagir, which makes me happy because he's an unbelievable friend to my father yeah uh, but if you asked me I would have said my father even when he was alive um, so there was that uh, there the dynamic was very fatherly mm. very fatherly you can you you'll sense that yeah. you know no I am your father but the language was like I if you told me that the these were messages exchanged from two best friends and one of them is trying to help the other I could see that yeah and I was more so referring to just uh, even outside of the ratings just in mm -hmm. real life you know that that Baba son dynamic was very much in play where I deferred to him I I feared him you know which we could have a whole conversation about whether that that's that's good you know do you think that's uh, good um no, I think it's good to fear Allah through your father because you know that your father is guiding you in that direction. So you fear your father because you don't want to let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala down. But you always have to bring it back to that relationship with your creator. And a parent should always remind the child that if you fear me, it should be because if you're disappointing me, you're disappointing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. And that you're fearing me because you know that this shortcoming will mean that you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think that reminder is very, very important. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, what happens... We idolize our parents. Of course. And when we idolize our parents, we're dis uh, Allah doesn't want that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want that. He wants us to defer to them, to respect them, to honor them, to listen to them, as long as they're guiding us in that path. But He doesn't want us to idolize them. And I made my father an idol. Oh, did you? I did, yeah. Mm. Unconsciously, we, most of us do. Mm. That's not to lessen my guilt. That's just to help other people reflect on the extent to which they make their mother or father an idol. How do you know if you made your father an idol or not? If their perception of you or their, um, you know, their, um, if, if you're constantly thinking, you know, I want to do this, will it make Baba happy or sad? Mm -hmm. Without thinking about, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it, that could serve you for a while, as, as long as your father's, you know, focused on what's best for you. But sometimes our parents come in, they come with their set of baggage and mistakes, and sometimes they're doing something more for culture than for deen. Absolutely. Masalan, if you know, I know nothing about your family. I'm just using an example. Go ahead. Uh, is your father alive? Yes. Allah ta'ala ba Um, you know, if you wanted to marry uh, a woman from Ethiopia, mm -hmm. I I don't know. Maybe your father's completely supportive. He might not be. Okay. Now the counter argument could be, but you're supposed to make your father content. Right. But at the same time, that could be your nasib, and that mm. might be, um. I don't want to say a fight worth putting up, but at least a difficult conversation or a series of them worth Absolutely. having. If you truly feel like this woman is your nasib, which are imams married women, you know, from, from uh, Ethiopia, cultures, yeah. from different cultures, different. Ra this is a very difficult pill for our parents to swallow, but we have to be honest and say, there, in this moment, mishmeshin asarat al mustaqim. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they might, now they might have other legitimate concerns that are. Not valid related to, too. Yeah, that are valid. Yeah. But that's where, you know, that's where um, 
we have to be careful because then if you're if you're gonna let's say Allah tests you with that and you're saying no to your nasib because to make Baba happy happy you could be you could be erring mm. I don't want to say sinning that's not my call that's a very good example very good example um what happened for you to escape the prison or when did you escape the prison this is why I say Harvard was not a bad thing for me and mm-hmm. it was a very good thing for me because um, aside from the what I was learning academically about education leadership, there was a huge part of our curriculum that was focused on, they call it adult development. And it's all based on this idea that most of the field of psychology is focused on how children grow. But there's this field of psychology that talks about adults don't stop maturing and growing and evolving you know, when they hit 30 or when they hit 25 or 40, they continue to grow. And the growth from 30 to 40 looks different than from 40 to 50 and so on. And so uh, the study of that is very much like a self-reflective healing journey. Between that and seeing my therapist weekly and being serious about my salah and being in communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I started to undo those layers. I came closer and closer to my deen. But ultimately, um, you know, it was Quran and it was Hadith and it was having somebody like my cousin Hassan in my corner who had that open heart, was very well educated, very knowledgeable. I would call him, I would ask him the difficult questions, oftentimes the ones that I did not want to hear a certain answer to. Mm. Do you think what I'm doing with music is wrong? Is it haram? You know, yeah, it's haram. No, of course not. Did you research? Did you look at the hadith? Why don't you have a look at the hadith and give me a call? You know, obviously Quran first, but sometimes the Quran is not. Yeah. You know, and we again we need Ahl al-Bayt to interpret the Quran. Of course. So, you know, I would do that journey. I'd come back and say, so now what am I supposed to do with with my life? My life and my all my instruments and whatever. What was the hardest thing to overcome from your past? Let me call it past life. Yeah. What was the hardest thing for you to overcome? From the weed to the music to the just the mental prison that you were in, what yeah. was the hardest to, to overcome? You know, I, I could say, so we, weed was hard. Um, you, you know, music was way harder because at this point, I really identified this way as a musician, you know, as a creative, as somebody who I'm going to prove everybody wrong, mm-hmm. you know, and show them that I could succeed. I'm just going to be that relentless. Even if I don't have that much talent in your eyes, watch me outwork everybody and get there. Mm-hmm. So I was very motivated by that, which a lot of people are motivated by that chip on their shoulder. Yes. And they can't imagine living their life without that chip on their shoulder because it's their fuel and they would lose their sense of identity without it. So the most truthful answer, the most honest answer is the biggest thing to overcome was that was truly surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. and telling them, I'm going to do whatever you want. Here's my whole career. I'm going to quit music. Uh, you're telling me to come back to Dearborn even though Los Angeles is the first city where I felt like I'm really, really happy here. I love the weather. I love being able to walk outside and get sunshine every day and walk everywhere. And I'm just really feeling good here and creative and all this stuff. I surrender it all to you. I'm going to move back home to Dearborn. I'm going to quit this music thing. I'm going to... Um, not know where to go next. I'm going to not know how to make money. I'm going to just surrender all of that to you and let you dictate my steps. Mm. That was obviously the hardest. There was, um, there's this very nice, uh, this is one of my favorite sentences in the whole book. I want to read it real quick. And it plays to what you just said. Are you sure the critics are wrong? Do you actually know what's right? Or are you too afraid to do the research and potentially upend your life? What I did know is that God neither requires nor forbids something unless it serves to help us, heal us, and bring us home. So the search began. This is a very difficult question to ask yourself because the bias that we have to, towards ourself is no, of course what I'm doing is right, you know? Um, especially when it comes to something life-changing, like I really have to leave everything behind and move back to Dearborn, start from zero. Uh, were you in your 30s here? Yeah, I think I was 29 or 30. 
Maybe no, I think I was thirty or thirty-one. You're, like you're in your thirties, yeah. And at, at thirty, you want to believe that you started yeah. to have your life put together, and you know what you're doing. Yeah. And then just to surrender like that is not easy, you yeah. know. Yeah. And you start to get a little emotional. Yeah. Which, uh, why? Cause uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is so merciful. Yeah. On the one hand, you. Um, you know you're giving everything up, but a part of you feels like, you know, if if I'm willing to do this, you know, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of being guided, like, you know everything, you know, you, you have the tawakkul, you have the faith, Allah, Allah puts it in your heart. Allah gives you that that confidence, that Godfidence to know, like, I'm, I'm going to lay out your steps. even And that just that leap of faith is, it's so beautiful at the same time. It's so beautiful. How are your conversations with God during that time? How do how how it's it's a personal question, you know. Yeah, Everyone no, talks beautiful. to God in their own way, but how how were those conversations like? You doubting your whole entire life, like what am I going to do now? You know. So what do you tell God? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I just heard a hadith. I think it was yesterday or the day before. That uh, s- somebody asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam um, either how they can uh, you know um, make up for a sin or get closer to to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and um, he told them to prolong their prostration. Um, I-, I love keeping my head on the sajda. They said that Imam Ali alayhi salam would do the entire dua kumail in the sajda on the sajda, mm. um, and. Uh, I just love to keep my head there after my salah and just just talk like just you know first I I focus on you know th- um praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then thanking him then um you know uh, um uh, repenting for my sins um then praying for others then praying for myself and when I get to myself I just you know whatever I'm whatever I'm concerned about uh, I'll bring up interpersonal issues that I'm having with family members I'll bring up feeling lost about what's next or what to do. Um, Allah, you know, I'm doing this with 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 good intention. You know, I'm, I feel I feel you're calling me back to move to Dearborn. You know, maybe my nasib is waiting there. Um, I know that you'll order my steps. Uh, I'm I'm surrendering to you. I'm doing it. You know my heart. You know it's. You know I'm 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 doing my best to to clean it and to surrender. So just wherever you take me, I'm ready. And when you can say that and mean it, then you know you know that it's. It's just a matter of time. A lot of people can say that, but they can't mean it. Yeah. So a key word yeah. there. How did that pay they off? They can, but they need some more work. Uh, how did that pay off? Uh, I moved back to, to Dearborn. Okay. I met my wife. Uh, I got married. Um, my little side hustle of helping people you know, edit their papers for college or graduate school became a full-blown business. Um, alhamdulillah, you know, I... Allah gave me my nasib, my rizqa. Um, you know, He brought me closer to the Deen. Uh, he just started to clean up every aspect of my life. All right, now that you're ready to do it my way, and not your way, watch this. Found, did you find exceptional results? Alhamdulillah. You did. Alhamdulillah. Allah. Walk me through the day of your father passing away. Um, my father had a. Uh, Heart surgery at Henry Ford Hospital. Okay. Um, I flew in for the surgery, mm-hmm. and I flew out a few days after. I was working a full time job at the time, in in Los Angeles. I, I was still at Harvard, but in our last year, we do something called a residency, kind of similar to med school, ten month residency, at a specific site. So, I was at that site working full time, writing a dissertation. So I flew in. The surgery happened. A few days later, he was reco- at home recovering. Alhamdulillah, everything went well. And uh, I flew out. And um, he was in his recovery. And, you know, they sent a nurse to the home. Everything looked good. Um, one night, he just uh, woke up, rose out of bed. Mama was sleeping next to him. She rose, Habibi, you need anything? What's going on? Um, he got up. He, you know, f- f- I-, I tell the story in Chapter 12, still broken. He... He finds his shahatas on the floor. He takes a few steps forward. He turns towards mama, and um, he just collapses. So um, 
soon thereafter, I don't know how many minutes after, my sister Rima gives me a call. I'm sleeping in, in I'm in bed in Los Angeles. It was over, it was during the night, and um, you know she wakes me up after a couple calls, and she tells me you know something happened and Baba fell and he died. Is that how she how she starts the phone call? Yeah, Ali, something happened and Baba fell and he died, and in between she's sniffling, um, but she just laid it to me direct like that. Which I, I think was probably a good move, you know. Can't Do you think so? Yeah, I wouldn't have wanted it delayed or sugar-coated. You know, I, I think I needed to know. The sooner I know, the sooner I, I, I can stawab, you know, even though. Uh, it's very hard to stawab yeah. in that moment. And I, I describe it in the book as uh, literally it was my, my best attempt to help you or the reader like uh, really follow me on what that felt like or really feel me on what that felt like. Um, felt like I got on this, this missile and it just like was speeding me through these these stages of grief, they call them. I didn't know about the stages of grief until after this happened, but... Um, what are the stages of grief? I don't, I don't memorize them anymore. I think there's like denial, bargaining, um, uh, acceptance. There, I'm missing at least one or two. But initially there's like this initial denial and the part of you that's connected to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want that for yourself. Mm. So so I, I felt like I flew through that stage, but I felt it intensely. And then the bargaining, like, okay, no, it's really bad, but he's not he's not gone. Or he's, he's, you know, maybe he'll come back in a second. Or, you know, maybe we don't know everything. Maybe they're going to revive him. Maybe it just, it just looks like he's he's gone, but he's not actually gone. So you're, you're bargaining, you know. Um, and you're even trying to negotiate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, no, like, you, you know, let let this not be, mm. you know, um, you know, and then you you get to acceptance, which obviously takes the longest. Um, and uh, did you fly back to his funeral? I, yeah, I, I I immediately flew back. Um, I, I, first I started. I, I left the apartment. I started uh, pacing around the blocks um, outside. Um, Why? In retrospect, I think you're you're trying to. Uh, you're trying to get out of your head, like physically, like you're you're trying to somehow you, you. The more confined the room is, the more trapped you feel in in your thoughts somehow. I don't, or maybe it was just uh, my my desperate attempt to try to create some sort of um, b room to breathe. Mm. You know, um, so I'm I'm walking, I'm walking, and then I call a lift, and then uh, you know I ask him to take me straight to the airport. Um, I warned the Lyft driver that, you know, there's a really good chance I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, lose my mind in this car, break down crying and things like that. Uh, I just lost my father, you know, and uh, he had just lost his mother a week, a week or two prior. So he talked me the whole way there, you know. He, he, he gave me moments of silence, which I, re I really needed, but he also gave me words of love and encouragement. And um, What are some words that might encourage someone in that situation? Um, I feel like there isn't. O only if if you're a believer uh if somebody's not talking about god at least in my experience then you kind of don't want to hear it mm. you know you don't want to hear you know the last thing you want to hear for me let me just talk about myself last thing i wanted to hear in that moment is the universe is you know has you you know or, the, uh, or um you know hey you know um Hang in there, you know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not putting a judgment on mm -hmm. those things. Like that's some people are at, but I, I was comforted by "I love you" from my friends and family, um, especially my friends, and I was comforted by you know uh, any words that had to do with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and His mercy and the supernatural strength that He's going to give us during this time and the patience and all of that. If it wasn't those two things, I. It didn't help me, even if I appreciated it. How funeral happened here? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, just going based off of what you told me about your father and what I've heard about him, this is, it was a probably massive funeral. A lot of people shows up showed up to that. Yeah. When you look at the amount of people that are coming, all from love and respect for your father. Does that give you a little bit of ease that my father really left his mark on the world? Because I feel like in those deep 
I still have my, Allah told Muhammad my parents who the rest of your family but I still haven't lost a parent but I feel like in those deep moments of of grief and pain you you really do a lot of reflection and you start looking at I don't know maybe signs of, like you see thousands of people walking into your father's funeral um, do you reflect on his life there like wow look at how many people he touched yeah you know I, I don't say this to lessen the impact that 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 had um because it was everything you're saying it was absolutely beautiful and inspiring it, it touched me it um made me emotional you know but what happened in Lebanon blew my mind because I, expe I expected it here mm. i expected it here and, and even with what i expected it was it was overwhelming the outpouring of love and support you know it's not like I had a number in my head. I, I expect, you know, 500 people to attend my father's funeral, you know. But I just, I knew that, I, that he had a great influence here. He had a lot of great relationships. Uh, hundreds, thousands of students that, that loved him, admired him, cared about him, and families. Um, and still, the outpouring of love here was tremendous. But when we got to Lebanon, I could not believe it. Like, when we got to the Janoub, there were banners uh, that started even before we got to El Layli. Um huge huge banners that had been printed with his face on it and quotes from the quran or you know the father of the orphans and the poor you know the fact that that was imam ali alayhi salam's you know one of his nicknames or the ways he was referred mm -hmm. that my father was being referred to in those words and being referred to by who by literally dozens if not hundreds of orphans yeah. you know um the amount of amal khair he had done although i knew that he did I, I had no idea the scale, no idea. And the, the way he made people feel there, you know, the, the, the amount of love, that the fact that they really truly felt like he had a father and, and what time did he get to spend in Lebanon? Shahar hon, shaharin honik, you know, shaharin hon, shahar hon. Like, it, it was, it was mind-blowing. Oh. Everybody was, the whole village was outside. They were either standing in their balconies. Some people were crying from their balconies. Most people were in the streets. Hundreds and hundreds of people, and um, you know, you start hearing the stories of Amal Khair. Uh, you know, my father, he went by that. I don't know if it's Quran or Hadith or just an Arabic saying, but you know, don't let the left hand n know what the right hand's giving. Like mm -hmm. the secrecy to that extent. Um, that's what he was doing, and he was. It just shows you the, not only the heart he had, but the iman. You know, mm -hmm. that he was truly building his life for the akhirah and what 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 we were shown after he passed away was what that house looks like in in the akhirah and that that's just an unbelievably overwhelming feeling that's beautiful what was your last conversation with him um the last conversation that i remember we we had a conversation after this but it was just small talk how are you doing he was very busy he had a lot of visitors after his surgery but the last conversation of substance that we had um was i had applied to be commencement speaker at harvard and what does that mean a uh, commencement speaker is the graduation ceremony speaker okay um you know it's a big deal it's a big honor you're speaking in front of uh, thousands of, of graduate uh, of graduates in your class I had done it. I had surprised him as the commencement speaker for the University of Minnesota when I graduated college. Um, you know, it made him cry. He was very happy. He was very proud, and I just felt like this would be the the icing on top. You mm -hmm. know, um, if I could do this and win the Harvard one and be chosen, and then you know do that, it would be like amazing. And so I told him, you know, I, I was gonna try to surprise him with it, but since he was in recovery, I felt like it would make him happy if I shared it mm -hmm. with him. So I'm like, you know, Baba. I applied to be the commencement speaker. I think it's the best speech I've ever written. You know, I think I'm going to get it. Like, I feel really good about it. I think I'm going to, like, win it. And he goes, Habibi, you've already won. And then he's, and then I, I got silent for a second. And he goes, do you understand me? Do you understand? You've already won. No matter what, you've already won. And what he was referring to was Islam. Mm. You know, and he, he reminded me of that dur uh, during certain stages or junctures in my life uh, where I wasn't sure what was next. 
Like when I applied to Harvard, I only applied to Harvard, nowhere else. I had no plan B. He told me, um, you know, Allah's with you. You're with Allah and He'll guide you. I'm not worried about you whatsoever. When he was previously, he'd be very worried about me at every stage. So uh, I felt like, you know, and I said in the book, like, I wrote, I didn't get, I didn't get chosen for commencement speaker. speaker, but the purpose it served was much bigger than than anything a commencement stage would have given me. Which it is gave you that conversation. That conversation dad? and those parting words, because days later I lost him. What was the hardest part of your dad leaving? Um, you know, my, my barber couldn't take me for this, uh, in time. It was my fault. I missed our appointment yesterday. I was coming back from the, from the hospital. My wife and I had to go in for something. And, um, so on the way back, we got stuck in traffic. I missed my appointment. He couldn't take me this morning. So I had to go to a new barber this morning. And, uh, you know, uh, he was asking me about my family and it, Whenever somebody asks me about my family, it, it, the shock reemerges. I realize I'm still absorbing the shock of the fact that, um, you know, after we lost Baba Allah Yarhamo, and then my Tata and my Imad, uh, three months later, um, you know, Farat al Haile, you know, um, and that that'll hurt my aunts and uncles. But everybody knows, to a large degree, it's it's true, that, you know, she, uh, my father was the eldest. He was like a second father figure. Especially after Jiddu Allah Yirhamu passed away, he stepped into that role. Well, he was already in that role, but he he was even more so that role in their eyes. And then uh, Teta was the glue, you know. Literally, I mean, the family jama'na kil jama'a because yeah. of her and at her house. And when we lost them two, um, it was just kind of each family f- for their own. And uh, you know, my mom moved to Lebanon because her whole family's there. Mm. Uh, my brother has been in Dubai. My sister has moved to LA and, you know, it's like, you know, I'm here, you know, with my aunts and uncles who are, I'm still very close to, um, my wife and her family and now our baby. Um, so we're, it's like this long transitional period where now we have to start your own life, our own life and family and that, that, that those new networks that we used to take for granted and we used to have. So I would say the hardest part about losing Baba is, um, you know, we lost, uh, I lost my best friend. Uh, we lost the leader of the family. Um, and uh, we lost the, the family spirit that used to be intact uh, largely because of him. Mm. I think about these situations where first, what you just described is heartbreaking, you know, because it's like you're actually opening up a new chapter, you know, but. Everyone. I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Can I interrupt you? Go ahead. The reason I brought up the barber is because right after I finished uh, sharing that, he told me how you know he's here alone, and his mom and dad are in Lebanon. He came here in 2018, and he has nobody at all. Mm. Not no aunts, uncles, cousins. Um, and uh, it just humbles you, you know. Not that I was feeling sorry for myself. Alhamdulillah, I don't really. Go in that direct. I don't move in that direction mentally, um, but nevertheless, reminders of how blessed you are are, are always good. Yeah, and uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I just wanted to that, share. That's that. a good clarification. Um, everyone deals with with loss differently, and um, as a man, you lost your father. Now you kind of do you feel pressure that you have to step into a role where you want to help your sister out like your father would have or you want to be there for your mother like your father would have do you understand that okay this is what i have to do now um it's very complicated okay. because there's still a parent present mm-hmm. and you still have to defer to the m um and you know sometimes you have uh certain ideologies or your, you know, certain ways of, um, certain things you think is right or best for your sisters um, that, you know, mama may or may not disagree with or, oh. or you know. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, I'm just trying to be for them what my cousin Hassan was for me. Mm. 
Yeah. And I don't always succeed at it, you know, not because I resort to judgment, but because um, sometimes it's hard because yeah. of just certain dynamics in play. There's uh, there's another part of the book that um, I wasn't going to bring up really, but then we, we had postponed our episode, uh, this recording, for a specific reason. Um, the emails that you mentioned with your father. Yeah. Um, this this one stuck with me. Um, and just to put it into perspective, you were going through a lot and your father was concerned about you. And he was kind of talking you out of the situation that you were in. He wanted to pull you out of that prison. Yeah. And he says, but you are a son and not a father. I want to hug you, kiss you, sniff you and smell you, cuddle you and tell you how much I love you how much we all love you. I beg you to trust me, and God is my witness. I will not lead you astray. But you are a father now, and that's why the episode was postponed. And as a father, do you kind of understand the feelings that your father was talking about? Even though it's you haven't been a father for too long, Yeah. but... You only have to be a father for a second Yeah. to understand. Do you understand the, the concern that your father had for you now? now that you are a father absolutely and i don't know as controversial as it might be to say <clears throat> i think i already understood it mm. you know and maybe maybe some people hear that as uh as, as arrogant or oh then you don't you actually don't know what it means to be a father yet um but maybe it's just a testament to how loving my parents were and the sacrifices I watched them make mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, although growing up they'd often tell us you don't appreciate, I did. Deep down I saw and I was astute and aware mm -hmm. and observing. So um, I'm not saying I understood exactly what it was like to be a father. I'm just saying that, you know, when my father shared those words, it would break me. Mm -hmm. It would break me because... Um, you know, I, I thought I was doing what I should do or what was best for myself or that he couldn't really understand. But at the same time, the fact that Makan Radi Alayya was shattering me in every way. Are there any unsaid words that you would have loved to tell your father? Alhamdulillah, because I came back to the deen, and he saw that, um, you know, I just feel like there's not so much like a sentence or specific words that I wish I could have told him as much as um, conversations I crave to have with him. You know, and uh, there's a part of the book where you saw the poetry mm -hmm. when I went to this uh, site in uh, near Atlanta, yes, uh, Chattahoochee Hills, and they had like, I was on the board for this organization and they allowed you as part of your service to the board because um, it's an unpaid volunteer thing to reserve the uh, these little um, cabins where they would put artists to write. Um, and so you're allowed to reserve them when they're not being used. So I would reserve them and go write. And so a few months after Baba passed, I reserved one. I went to write, and I really thought I was going to make a big push on the book, mm. and I, I couldn't. I just had no inspiration in me other than you know to grieve and to write poems about the gr the grieving process which subhanallah ended up being in yeah, the book. Being, yeah. um, you know, so in one of those poems, uh, I talk about how, you know, um, I, I think it was the one where I talk about, you know, uh, um, in your silence were the secrets that you didn't care to keep buried in the deep south of your soul. Mm. And it just relates to um, another uh, another one of the poems or the things he used to say to me a lot was ask me before you lose me a hadith yes. from Imam Ali alayhi salam. And um, my father was a very silent man. Um, and you, you would only get if you asked. If you asked, he was ready. Mm. He was ready with the hadith, ready with the Quran, ready with you know, the knowledge, the wisdom that you needed. But you had to ask. Um, and I, I said in that poem, I felt like I was just getting into that rhythm, that, that right shot to your heart rhythm where I would ask the right question. And inspire the right conversation when the rhythm of your heart stopped. Yeah, and so that's how I feel. I just feel like the the new era of our friendship that we were walking into 
was going to be by and far the most beautiful, the most fruitful. Or now we have the same values. Now we're on the same page. You know, Mayshin had bad. I'm no longer a source of stress, worry, yeah. distraction. But I'm, I'm your, fr- I'm your. You're gonna see me as a friend too. Yeah. And just as we're entering that stage, and warming up, he passes away. Mm. You, it's striking to listen or, or read how the Harvard graduation was, um, where your father wasn't there for it, but your father was there for you graduating out of that prison, mm. right? And yeah. I think that's a way more valuable graduation for him to be present in than the Harvard graduation. Yeah, it's right? beautiful. Yeah, and, I, and I'm happy for you that that was the case and you not being like, I wish he was here to see me graduate out of the prison. Right. You know, I, right. I'm pretty sure you do prefer him seeing you graduate out of the prison than graduate out of Harvard. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this. Um, you know, I think uh, this might not resonate with her. This is, you know, this is just my perception. But when I think about my sister, my younger sister, both of my younger sisters really like that's what breaks my heart the most what and in some ways even my older brother that you know i don't feel like baba really got to see them graduate from that mental prison Mm. so i can't imagine i you know i think um i largely attribute my ability to heal from it at least in the time frame that i did and we're all still healing from it. Of course. But just to make peace, um, of course, there's deen and tawakkul and all of that. But there's also like, you know, mm-hmm. you know? and I'm not saying he wasn't radi alayun, but um, I'm just saying that, you know, I felt like he and I were aligned. And mm-hmm. I don't know how much my other siblings felt that way. So mm-hmm. it just uh, it hurts me to think about. I mean, I guess if you're that person that, like you said, like your cousin Hassan was to you, uh, then it'll all be good in the end. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. What's one thing that we didn't talk about today that you think we should have? I wouldn't say there's anything that we, you know, should have talked about that we didn't. I think it was a beautiful conversation, which you're an, a master at. So How are you? Thank you for that. Um, But, you know, I guess the first thing that came to mind is um you know just the uh, the crisis we have in our community you know whether it's uh the opioid uh crisis the the spiritual drain um the disconnectedness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh the the guys I graduated from at Fortson the guys graduating and the girls graduating from Dearborn High at so Ford um, and our community are suffering from a lot of things. And, you know, as much as accountability is important, uh, understanding the context that led them to that is, is equally important. Mm. And so whether it's the gambling habits, um, the dependency on, you know, uh, painkillers, um, the, the brothers and sisters were losing due to mistakes like that. A lot. The internalized oppression, the lack of understanding of deen, um, the sectarian war and hatred, um, the lack of educational opportunity, the lack of awareness parents still have, and uh, with relation to the book, the fact that, like I say in the book, this is not a book about history. There's one thing I really want people to know with regards to the book. I said it in, I think, chapter 12. We've handpicked from a thousand acres of history to help showcase the present day. Mm. And so um, that's, I think that's what I would say. Mm. I mean... I like to look at that stuff as okay. What are you gonna do about it? That's that, and you you talked ab- about it as um, the area that we're living in right now. But I'll take it as farther as the larger immigrant community, the Arab Muslim community that is in the West, 
like what are you going to do about it like these are the problems that you have in this community and all the other communities yes like let's do something about it 100% thank you Ali for this beautiful conversation Habib, it thank was you. Uh, it was honestly like I wanted it even to go longer but I'm happy that it went this long only so we can have a part two later inshallah ya Rabbi. Um, tell us where we can find your book it's on all online platforms mm-hmm. Amazon Barnes and Noble Target.com and um the last couple of weeks have been a bit of a storm, so uh, there are some delivery delay issues that we're addressing right now. Mm-hmm. It is available hardcover on Prime right now. You could get the ebook, uh, but paperback will soon be resolved where you can get it on Prime, two day delivery, uh, as well as the audio book will be available soon, inshallah. Are you recording it? Yeah, uh, we're done. We're just making oh, you recorded it. We're fine tuning, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Habib. Thank you.